Software products, specifically SaaS tools, are often seen as a sort of holy grail of online marketing. But the truth is, they're actually very, very difficult to build and to promote. So today I'm going to be interviewing Mark Thompson, co-founder of Pay Kickstart. They're a shopping cart and affiliate management platform that do over a million dollars a year in annual recurring revenue. And today we're going to be talking about how to get started developing software tools and SaaS products, even if you're not a developer and have no coding knowledge. And we'll also go into some of the sales, marketing and product launch strategy, which he uses to promote his product. Let's get started. Welcome to the show, Mark Thompson. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, before the show, we were chatting about the the Warrior Forum because it seems we were both active on there back in the day. Uh, can you tell us how you got your start in online marketing and specifically what role the Warrior Forum played in that? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess we're dinosaurs. Anyone who knows what the Warrior Forum is, it's not as popular as as it is as it was today. But um, yeah, so it's it's the largest digital. Uh, forum online for internet marketers. And so there's actually a section on the Warrior Forum called Warrior Special Offers. And it's really a marketplace where vendors and product sellers can go and sell all different types of products, information products and software. And so I always thought it was kind of odd that people were selling products in a forum. It was just kind of a, an odd thing, but it was kind of amazing because inside of the Warrior Forum, there's a um, in that particular part of the forum, you can see how many people are actively looking at each thread. And so you could see like thousands upon thousands of people looking at, at, at a, a thread at any given time. And so it really caught my interest to see that people were selling thousands of copies of their software, of their information programs to people um, all over the world. And so at the time, um, I was working, you know, I was, I was kind of balancing a couple things. I was working with a lot of marketing clients. So I worked with a lot of small to medium sized businesses and I hated the concept of trading time for money. I hated, uh, it was really hard for me to scale that model of selling a service. And so I loved the concept of selling a product 24, seven, 365 days a year. And um, just it, it just seemed so much easier to scale. But at the time, I really didn't know how to create a, a product and bring it to a market. And so I just kind of sat in the background for uh, about a year wa watching and studying this this marketplace on the forum. And um, I just started to connect with different people that were active in the forum. So I started to meet other product creators and started to learn kind of like, hey, you know, like what, what works really well to sell? And, and so I had a lot of knowledge in search engine optimization, pay-per-click, email marketing, social media marketing, because I was doing it for my clients, but I had never actually wrapped it up into a product. And so that's kind of how things got started with me, you know, even you know, beginning to think about, you know, taking my knowledge and wrapping it up as a product. What was the first product you actually launched on there? It actually, it was an Excel file. So it was called the Link Builders Toolkit. And so it was just a CSV file that showed people where they can go to find high quality backlinks. And so backlinks were really popular at the time, especially for anyone trying to optimize their website for Google. And so I sold it, I think for like 17 bucks or $27. I can't remember. Um, and it was just literally a CSV. It showed the link uh, of like the main website, a link to where they go to actually create the backlink and then just kind of some notes on what they need to do. And so it was really that simple. And so it was actually just like an internal doc that I had for building backlinks for my customers and clients. And I just kind of threw it out there to see if anybody would buy it. And was that like a, an aha moment for you? Did you did you start realizing, okay, maybe there's there's something in this or, or was that not until later? I mean, I think it was a small aha moment. It wasn't anything groundbreaking. You know, I, I probably had maybe 20 or 30 people buy it, but just the fact that I was able to create a product that someone would buy was kind of a groundbreaking moment for me, but it, it wasn't, you know, life-changing by any means, but it, that that was a stepping stone to bigger, better things. What was the next in that line of uh, bigger, better things then? Yeah, so I, I, I probably, I made a, a huge mistake. And so what I did was, uh, if anyone knows who Jeremy Shoemaker is, he's been around forever as well. And he had this thing called the Good Karma List Machine. And it was this, it was a script to help you build your email list. And so what would happen is you'd opt in for something, uh, a, a white paper or download, 
And then it would send that person who opted in to a thank you page and it's, and it gave them a referral link and it said, Hey, go and tell other people about this. You can earn additional bonuses or additional downloads or whatever it is that you wanted to incentivize them with, to go and share their link and get other people to download your offer. And so I thought that was a really cool concept. I loved the idea of viral list building, but it was really hard to set up. Um, I didn't understand how to install scripts and how to create databases and all that. And so I was like, well, what if I can take that concept and create a WordPress plugin out of it? Because at the time WordPress was, was really big and popular. Um, people weren't really doing SaaS. And so I hired a company that um, was kind of well-respected in the marketplace to build this product. And so I spent about $30,000 in creating this product. And at the time I didn't really know anything about building software. So I just relied on them and it was a pretty big, you know, leap of faith to try to go and build this thing and take really all the savings that I had at the time to go and build this product. And so that's what I did. I created uh, my first piece of software without really understanding the process. <laughs> how, I mean, how do you even start doing something like that? Not being a, a developer yourself. Did, did you just find them somehow and, and, and just hope that they were going to do a good job or? Well, so th there was a product that they created, it's called pop-up domination. And, and if anyone who's been around for a while, that was a, a really uh, popular product back in the day. It was a WordPress um, plugin that helped you to build your list. And so I kind of hunted down the, the development uh, agency that built that product. And so I kind of knew they had somewhat of a track record. Um, and so I reached out to them and, you know, knowing what I know now and, and the fact that I know how to manage development teams and the development process, I probably could have had that thing built for probably like $6,000, but you know, you don't know what you don't know. And so I obviously paid a premium for it, but they did a good job. It's, you know, I've heard of so many horror stories of people getting screwed out of money and, and, you know, products only getting half built and then the guy leaves. And so, um, I was lucky, um, where, you know, I actually had, a, a the product was done and ready. Um, but you know, I, I kind of realized that there was a lot more to launching a product than just creating the product. Uh, and yeah, that was going to lead on to my next question. So we, we have a sort of similar experience, you know, building and developing courses. I know it's a slightly different product at the end of the day, but I think a lot of people, there's this perception that, oh, if you build a really cool SaaS tool, or if you build a course, people will just somehow magically find it, but you have to do a little bit more sort of legwork to it. Uh, can you talk about how some of the things that you did to maybe promote that in the, that, that tool in the early days? Yeah. So there's a couple of things that I, I definitely learned. So the one thing was, you know, as you said, like it, it's not, if you build it, they will come type of thing, right? You have to actually go out and market it and do the legwork to get exposure. And the other thing, especially with software is it's kind of like a, a living, breathing entity. It's not just like you build it and you still have to support it, right? You still have to, you know, improve on it. And so that's really just the beginning uh, I learned. Um, and so when I, when I released it, I, I put it on the warrior forum. I may have sold, I don't know, maybe 30 or 40 copies of it, but I, I didn't really know what I was doing. I just figured I'd throw it on the, on the warrior forum and, and it would sell great. But, um, I realized that there was way more involved. And so what I did was actually reached out to someone who was, um, kind of relevant in the space. He was an authority in the space. And so I said, Hey, I have this product. It's, it, you know, I, I launched it. It didn't really do that well. Um, can you help me, you know, get more exposure, get drive more traffic to it? I'll give you 50% of the revenue. Just help me get this thing in the hands of more people. And so that's what he did. And so, um, that was really one of my big aha moments. We kind of relaunched it and he had connections with lots of, uh, affiliate partners. So affiliates went and promoted this thing and we, uh, redid the sales page. We added some, um, upsells to the sales funnel. And so that was actually when we were able to do my first six figure launch. And that was to me like life changing revenue, like just that, just being able to kind of look over his shoulder, see how he went through the process of marketing it, how he changed the price points, how he updated the sales funnel, how he got people on board who have um, like-minded email lists to promote it. And within seven days, we you know generated over a hundred thousand dollars. And that was just like, crazy money to me. And even though I wasn't receiving all that money, you know, we had to pay affiliate partners and we had to pay um, my partner on the project, just being able to see him go through that process and kind of sit behind the scenes and watch it was amazing. 
That's really impressive. How did you actually convince him to take you seriously and to, to sort of like help you promote it? Because I know we get a lot of people emailing us, hey, I've built this new tool or plugin. Can you promote it? I'll give you X percent yeah. or whatever. Um, but I mean, I don't think we've we've ever said yes to, to, to any of those. You must have done something to convince him. Like what, what was your strategy there? Yeah, so I mean, I did leave out the, the, the point that I did contact 10 other people and everyone else said no. Uh, the good news is you only need one person to say yes. And, and it was actually a good fit at the time. And so I, I think for him, you know, there was a lot of upside, right? The, the, I spent tens of thousands of dollars developing this product. Um, it was very unique to the marketplace, but list, list building has always been a big thing. So it, it's popular and it, it kind of spans all different industries and niches. So there's a wide audience. And um, it was it was really ready to be marketed. So I mean, he didn't really have to do much outside of really the sales and marketing side of things, which he had down to a T. And so it was really easy. You know, it was kind of turnkey, ready to go. And so it was it was kind of a quick win for him. So there was a lot of upside. So he was basically getting people he knew, or like other affiliates, to pr to promote it. Then, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, and how, how has that model evolved for you then? So you, you, you now, uh, run and you're a co-founder of, of pay kickstart. So it's, a. Uh, in fact, why don't you tell everyone what it is? Yeah. So, so pay kickstart. So it's, it's a, it's a billing and affiliate management solution. So we work with all sorts of digital sellers mainly. So maybe you're selling software or a membership site or an information product. Um, we help you to accept payments, manage recurring billing, uh, manage affiliate partners. We help. Um, optimize the checkout process, maximize conversions during that checkout process. We help retain more customers uh, to, you know, help with uh, the dunning process when, you know, failed payments happen. Um, so we do all these types of things and we remove all the technical hurdles that come along with accepting payment, managing recurring revenue, all this kind of stuff that really, you know, uh, entrepreneurs and business owners don't want to have to worry about. You just connect your PayPal, your Stripe accounts, and then we handle the rest. Um, so, um, yeah, we work with about 1500 different vendors right now, uh, mainly digital vendors, but we do work with some physical sellers as well, but, um, we're not the traditional add to cart Shopify Magento type of, of, uh, billing solution. There, there seems to be quite a focus for you guys on the affiliate side of things. So having other people promote promote your products, was that born out of your own experience with these earlier launches then? Yeah, so you know, for five or six years, we really did uh, max, like we leveraged the product launch formula like more than almost anyone I know. So we created lots of different products and programs. And so we realized as we started to release these products that there were so much lost revenue and opportunity that was being missed out on from using all these existing shopping carts and affiliate solutions. I found them to be super archaic, missing, you know, functionality that we needed. And so we built the tool out of necessity. So really pay kickstart was an internal tool that we used to sell our own products. And so we, you know, after using it internally for about a year and a half, people started to contact us and be like, that's a really cool checkout page. Or how did you do one click uh, upsells or how, all these different questions were like, well, you know, would you be interested in using it for your own business? And, and they were like, you yeah, know, I'd love to. And so that kind of got our wheels spinning saying like, hey, we could actually turn this into a platform that, that other businesses can use. Uh -huh. And how, how did you actually go about creating it then, you know, not, not being a developer your, yourself? Well, you know, I, so I learned a lot over five or six years. And so I learned the development process. I learned how to hire developers, how to manage them properly, how to manage expectations. Um, all that kind of stuff was kind of a long road of five or six years of, of creating software. And so, you know, we didn't just go out and just build pay kickstart because I mean, what it is today. It's, it's a beast. It's, it's a massive SaaS application, but it was something that was learned over the years. And so I had, um, you know, hired and fired countless numbers of developers. So, you know, it was something that happened over years and, and we were able to create a really solid team. So I hired a CTO who was able to manage our development team. And we really had a well-oiled machine of being able to code efficiently, have, you know, uh, QA checks to make sure that, you know, all the bugs were worked out. And so we worked out this process over a number of years to, um, to, to be able to even create pay kickstart. And then once pay kickstart was created and brought to, um, you know, live to, to the public, um, you know, we've spent the last four years just continuously improving on it and maturing the platform. 
So knowing what you know now about that whole process of bringing on developers, creating software, what advice would you give to yourself if you could go back in time to just before you created uh, pop-up domination? Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and uh, I'm sort of posing this question because I'm sure there's a lot of people listening out there who, you know, maybe they've been in IM for, for a while and they have a, a plugin or a software idea in, in their head, but what do they actually, what should those people actually do if they want to bring their idea to life? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I get it asked a lot. Um, so there's a couple things. The first one is to make sure that your product is focused on, on solving one pain or challenge. Don't try to do too much. Um, I know a lot of people, especially when you're creating software, you get feature happy and you're like, well, we can't release the product until it has this feature and this feature and that feature. And before you know it, you've extended your development roadmap another six months, another year, another two years. All the while, you could have released it to the public. And yes, while it didn't have everything that you wanted it to have, you could at least start to generate revenue. You could get it into the hands of people and start to you know, find bugs, uh, figure out ways to improve on it, um, and just be the best at one thing. Um, and so I think that was one thing that we did early on was the mistake of trying to accommodate so many different people saying, well, you know, I needed to do this, I needed to do that. And so we really tried to just have it do so much when you know, we, we could have just had it focused and have it be the best at one thing and market it that way. And then over you know the course of the next months and years, continue to have it evolve. So that was one thing that, that we definitely made um, a mistake on. Um, the other thing was trying to work on too many projects. Uh, we, we spread ourselves too thin um, and we only had limited resources. And so what was happening was we were just starting to be average um, for all of these different products. And so once pay kickstart kind of went public and, and, and um, you know, went live to the public, uh, we really had to kind of shift our focus, our energy, our resources towards making the platform the best billing and management solution it could be. Um, and so the other products that we created over the years, while we still support them, we actually have a small team managing them. We realized in order to make um, pay kickstart a mainstream SaaS application and be able to compete with other solutions that are in the marketplace, which is a, a pretty competitive marketplace, we needed to kind of be all in. And so that was something that, you know, we, we learned early on that we needed to make that decision to, to really go all in, um, you know, after the first six or, or six months to a year. Do you think it's worth partnering with a, a developer if you have a, a software software idea, or do you think you should just hold on to your equity and, and hire people to do it? Um, it depends on what position you're in. So early on, that's what I did for a lot of projects. I would partner with developers. And so obviously that's gonna help mitigate your risk because you're not having to pay for the development resources or, or less, um, you can at least, cut the cost in half if, if you're splitting it with a developer, but that definitely helps, right? Just starting out, maybe you're just gonna create a basic piece of software, having that person to be able to, to develop it, not have to pay that overhead is, is huge. Um, if you are you know, more of a mature entrepreneur, you've maybe created lots of businesses, you have capital at your disposal, you may want to take on more risk and not have uh, a partner, a, a technical partner, and just hire and pay a CTO to do that. Um, I actually have a partner on Pay Kickstart, and um, he's we're both kind of sales and marketing people. So um, while I do have a partner, we kind of help to divide and conquer the different sales and marketing pieces that come with you know a SaaS application. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 2020, where does one go to hire a developer these days? Yeah, so I mean, there's lots of different places. We have found that uh, Upwork has been probably the, the best place. Uh, we go to Upwork.com. Um, we have uh, we have a virtual team, so there's about 25 of us, all in different countries, um, cities. Uh, so it's it's really kind of cool. Um, so we we tend to hire a lot of developers from uh, Eastern Europe, so everywhere from Russia to Moldova to Ukraine. Um, there's a lot of talented development uh, de developers out there. Um, but you have to really understand the process. You, you need to know how to communicate with them because there is somewhat of a language barrier. So you need to be able to manage them appropriately, which um, that doesn't happen overnight. It was something that we learned. We've been um, outsourcing overseas for about uh, eight or nine years now. So it definitely doesn't happen overnight, but there's talent everywhere um, across the world. Um, but Upwork.com has been a, a great resource. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever used Jawbrack? I haven't. There's 
God, there's probably dozens of different hiring sites out there, freelancer.com and, you know, onlinejobs.ph. JobRex, JobRex uh, focused on, on Eastern Europe. Um, oh, okay. So it's, uh, it, it could be, it could be actually a good one to check out. Uh, so when you're developing the pay kickstart, what was your goal to, to, to say, okay, this is our MVP. We're going to launch it when we have, you know, this amount of features. Like how, mm-hmm. how did you determine that? Yeah. So what, well, it started as an internal tool. So, uh, initially we just wanted to be able to accept PayPal, accept credit card, create like a basic checkout template, um, be able to, uh, let's see, what else do we have? We, uh, actually in the, in the very beginning, we didn't even have an affiliate management platform. We actually passed all of the, the, um, details to a third party affiliate management solution. So when we first launched it, it was really just a billing checkouts, um, you know, platform. And then we added the affiliate management piece when we released it to the public. So we, we didn't release to the public until we had both the billing and the affiliate side of things. And then once we did that, we really allowed our vendors to dictate what should be added next. Um, and so, I mean, God, there's a laundry list of different things that we added. We added more, um, payment options like wire transfer, um, PayPal credit. Uh, then we added things like a customer billing portal to allow customers to go and update their billing details, go and upgrade and downgrade. Um, I mean, just like order bumps and coupon codes and tax management. I mean, the list goes on. So we had a, that, that was one challenge that we had was really trying to prioritize it. And, um, one way we did that was we created uh, a feature request area where people can submit feature requests. They can go and vote on them and that would help us to prioritize. Yeah, and I notice a lot of software tools. Whenever you're talking about something in their Facebook group, they're always saying, "Have you have you submitted a feature request? Have you submitted <laughs> a feature request?" But it's good to see that people actually do listen listen to those. Um, yeah, I mean th- that that was a huge problem. Like before we did that, people would say, "Hey, I need this feature. I need that feature," and we had no way to manage it. So like it, they were just coming in all different directions. And so finally, we were able to create like a central repository for it and just made it much easier to manage. And it's more transparent too, because all of our, all of our vendors can see what's been released, what we're working on, what's in the pipeline, you know, what is kind of sitting in a bucket uh, that people can vote on and we can hopefully move those up the priority if, if more and more people want it. And you mentioned earlier as well that uh, I think it was a pop-up domination or one of the other mm-hmm. tools you launched that there's there's a significant or there's a meaningful support overhead in terms of updating it and, and just supporting users. What percentage of your effort or team resources kind of goes into supporting existing customers versus building and growing the tool? Yeah, so that that is probably one of the biggest uh, changes I have made, um, both as as an entrepreneur and as a business. Um, you know, when when we created products, it was completely flipped. So we would spend, you know, eighty percent of our time creating the product, getting it marketed out there, and then twenty percent of our effort would go towards just kind of ma- maintaining it, adding new features here and there. Um, but that has completely changed. So. I would say probably 60 or 70% of our effort is really just around customer happiness, making sure that they're happy, making sure that they're using the tool, that they're getting onboarded properly, that we're giving them everything they need to get to first value as quickly as possible, and that they're getting all the value that we promised that they're getting with the tool. Because, you know, once, and that's the difference between, you know, um, like back in the day when we would sell a product at a one time fee versus, you know, now we're really focused on recurring billing, getting people to pay month over month, year after year. And in order to get people to do that, you need to have great customer support. You need to be able to onboard them properly. You need to give them the, the, the resources and the tools they need to be successful with your product or they're going to leave because there's so much competition in the marketplace now. You really need to provide them with all that. And how do you do that? How do you give someone a good onboarding experience in a software business? Yeah. So uh, a couple things. So, um, you know, one, one thing, uh, especially like in the, like about two years ago, we had a really big churn problem. We had people canceling at, at alarming rates. And so it was very hard for us to, to even scale because so many customers were leaving after a couple months. And so we had to really understand why they were leaving. And so we would survey them and find out that it was just too, 
it was confusing. They didn't know where to go once they've signed up. And so one thing that we added about a year and a half ago, or maybe a year ago now, was um, uh, an in-app onboarding process. So as soon as they sign in, they can see, okay, step one, do this. Step two, do that. Step three, do that. Just to get them to first value as quickly as possible. So that was, that was one step in the right direction. And we noticed that our churn got cut in half when we did that, but it still wasn't to the point where we were happy or satisfied with it. Um, I guess you, you never really are, but um, so another thing that we did was we added the ability to, uh, we added live chat. So we have 24 seven live chat where people can ask questions and we can um, help them that way. So that was another thing that we added. And again, we noticed that our churn started to go down when we added that but we weren't satisfied there. So another thing that we actually just recently added was a 30 minute complimentary onboarding call. So they can jump on a call with our onboarding team, with our product uh, uh, success team, and be able to ask questions, make sure that they're get, we're getting them over that initial hurdle. Because with any, especially any big SaaS application, there's that learning curve. We wanted to get them over that learning curve as quickly as possible. And so we added that, and again, we noticed that our churn uh, started to go down even more. So it's been one of those things, it's been an ongoing effort and it doesn't happen overnight, but little by little we learn more and we figure out new ways that we can get those customers the first value and make sure that they're happy and using the product. And when you initially launched it, how did you go about selling and promoting it? And how has that sales and promotion approach changed over time as you've matured? Yeah, it's a good question. So in the very beginning, you know, we had a list of probably 100,000 customers that had purchased products from us in the past over, you know, five or six years. So that was kind of the, you know, the first thing that we did was we promoted to that list. So that was really nice that we had that in our back pocket. A lot of companies don't have an existing customer base to market to. So we were lucky there. Um, we also had a lot of relationships with affiliate partners. So we were able to run webinars and uh, they were able to drive traffic to you know landing pages and sales pages to get people to sign up that way. So we would offer referral commissions for anyone that signed up through their affiliate links. And so those were probably the first two ways that we were able to get our initial customers on board. Um, but you know, once we, if, if I can just dig into one of those, sorry, it. cause it's really interesting about the, the, the webinar side of things. So that's, mm -hmm. that's basically where you go and do a co-hosted webinar with, with the affiliate. Is that what you mean? Yes. So, uh, they would drive people to a registration page and, um, I would present a webinar. They would drive the, their customers, their, their audience to this webinar. And then I would make some sort of an offer at the end of the webinar and those affiliates would earn a commission off of uh, whatever was sold. And was that very successful? Um, yes and no. It, you know, we, we realized that it's not easy to get someone to switch shopping carts or bill, uh, billing solutions, um, especially early on when people didn't know who the heck we were. Um, people were like, you know, I, I'm not going to trust this company with, with, you know, really my business, right? The, I mean, the most important part, the billing part of it. So it was, we found it, it was kind of slow going in the beginning, but after a couple of years, you know, things started to change. Once we started to get brand exposure and we got a footprint on the web, people really started to, you know, trust us more. Um, and that's when we started to have more of a snowball effect of more and more people would start to sign up, people, you know, and especially once, you know, they had a, a great experience with the product, then we started to get more word of mouth and people started to organically start talking about it and more and more organic signups started to happen. Mm -hmm. And so, um, how has, how do you do marketing these days then for your, your tool? Yeah. So it's, it's evolved a lot. So, um, you know, I would say a lot of it is, is word of mouth. Um, it's also more of a long-term strategy. So we have a, a pretty robust, uh, content strategy. So we do a lot of search engine optimization. So, um, you know, we, we optimize for a lot of long tail keywords that people would be searching for. Um, so we, we post about two or three blog posts, uh, a, a, a week on our blog. We also do things like podcast interviews, like we're doing today. Um, we'll do co-branded webinars with partners. Um, so it's it's definitely a more robust strategy. We have lots of kind of um, coals in the fire. We have lots of different uh, traffic strategies. We'll do some retargeting. So we don't do a ton of paid search, but we do some retargeting. Um, we'll do, we'll still, you know, run webinars with affiliates. 
um, the organic side, which is more more of a long term strategy. You know, we've been working on our organic uh, traffic for for years now, and I would say just in the last six to twelve months, that's been our main growth channel has been through through content. So that's like your your own blog talking about how to install a shopping cart or or yeah. things like that. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what metrics do you track on the the sales side of things? Then, what what's important for you as a software business? The I mean, we track a lot of metrics. The main metrics are going to be like our our MRR, so you know, monthly recurring revenue. Uh, we're also looking at churn. We're also looking at the average customer value. Um, and so, one thing that we've really tried to focus on, and, and it's kind of an ongoing effort now, is expansion revenue. So, how do we get those customers that were paying us, you know, twenty nine dollars a month when we first started? How do we get them to pay us ninety nine dollars, or one hundred fifty bucks, or two hundred dollars a month? So, we've really put a lot of focus on getting our existing customer base to spend more with us through add-ons, through you know, um, uh, upgraded uh, 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 plans, that kind of stuff. And how do you go about determining your pricing model in such a tool? Well, probably the biggest mistake we made was the fact that the pricing and plans that we had from the beginning were the pricing and plans that we had four years later. So we never changed our pricing or plans for four years. And actually, um, at the time that we're recording this, we recently just updated our plans to kind of reflect the, the maturity of the platform. It's, it's evolved so much from what it was four years ago. So, you know, it's more in line with, you know, some of our, our more mainstream competitors. And so we've kind of, uh, we've read, we've redone the, the plans and pricing from the ground up. And um, so that, that has definitely been a, a major growth channel just in the last couple of weeks since we released the new plans. Um, we've already seen an uptick in, in MRR and customer value, all those things across the board. And how do you go about differentiating yourself from competitors in, in that space? Because there's a lot of shopping carts out there, but yeah. you seem to have a, a, a somewhat unique angle or take on it. Yeah, so uh, we have kind of a, a unique seller proposition depending on like who we compete with. So like there's a lot of uh, billing solutions like re recurring billing solutions. Uh, a lot of those solutions don't have an affiliate management component. So that's one thing that kind of differentiates us is, you know, not only can we handle your billing, we can also handle your affiliate side. So you don't need a third party tool to do that. Um, there are also solutions out there that are both a, a billing and affiliate solution, but they're not as flexible. They don't have as much customization. So, you know, things like one click upsells and coupon codes and order bumps. And, you know, we have a, a mobile app. So there's all sorts of unique um, selling propositions there. So it really just kind of depends on, you know, what type of customer, because we have different segments of customers that we work with. And in, in a software business, how do you deal with competitors? That, do, you, do you find they, they copy your features or is there a lot of that kind of thing <laughs> go, goes on? Um, I mean, they do, but to be honest with you, I, I don't really even worry about competitors. I just worry about the customer. I mean, as long as the customer is happy, they're not going to leave. So that's really what I spend the majority of my time on. I mean, do I go and look at competitors? Of course I do. I want to see what they're doing and you know what what's going on in the marketplace. But I mean, I would say I'd spend 90% of my time just more focused on the customer, getting feedback from them and just figuring out how can we you know, help them sell more, make more money. You, you mentioned that it is, is a little bit challenging to get people to switch their billing uh, solution over to you because it's, it's quite a sort of core aspect of, of, mm -hmm. of their business. Is the flip side of that also true? Like it, once they're in, they're kind of, they tend to be in for, for quite a while. Yeah, absolutely. And that, so that was the, you know, the reason that our churn was so high was we noticed that people were leaving in the first month or two, but if we could give, get them over that hurdle, they're customers for life. Because, you know, again, with a billing solution, you're, that's really integrated into the core of your business. And so we did find once people got past that threshold, they're very comfortable with the tool, they're happy with it and, and they stay for life. So um, a couple things that we did to help um, make it a seamless transition from one shopping cart to ours would be like, we help them to import subscriptions from their uh, previous uh, solution into ours. So it, it can be as easy as, hey, I have a whole bunch of 
Stripe uh, subscriptions in my Stripe account. Um, and we could just with one click import those into the platform and then we could take over. So we did that as well as um, having, you know, training our, our product success team on, you know, helping them overcome challenges along the way just to make it a smooth transition. And do, do you think that SaaS as a space is getting more competitive these days? Oh, absolutely. I mean, um, there's no better time to start an online business and uh, it's it's relatively easy to start a SaaS business these days. So you see more and more competitors pop up, um, but as more and more competitors pop up, a lot of them are, are leaving and, and dying quickly. So um, if you're not in it for the long haul and uh, you're not having a long-term play and you're, and you're not focused on customer success, uh, you won't last in the marketplace. So what do you think is the main thing that differentiates successful SaaS businesses from unsuccessful ones? Is it that customer focus? It, it I, I think it's the customer focus. And so, um, and that's really what we've been obsessed with. And it's, re, it's the reason that we've spent so much emphasis on 24 seven live chat, making sure that when people submit a, a, a ticket, you know, we're replying to them, you know, within minutes, most of the time, um, creating so many tools and resources, uh, uh, you know, knowledge based articles and quick start guides and webinars and, and uh, tutorial videos and in-app onboarding, all of these things play a role in customer happiness. Uh, and if you were to do it all over again, start uh, starting a pay kickstart, what would you have done differently? I won't do it again, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, what would I do differently? I mean, God, I would have done a lot of things differently. I think, and, and I'd alluded to it before as, you know, I tried to accommodate to so many different audiences instead of just focusing on one industry, being the best in that marketplace and going after those, that audience. And so in the beginning, it was, it was very hard because, you know, all of our, our, our messaging, our product was kind of general. It was just like, well, who do you, who do you serve? Right. And so people would come to the website and they'd be like, well, is this, is this solution for me or not? I'm not sure. So I think just having more focus early on would have, would have been better. And then you can start to tackle different industries, different segments as you start to grow. Uh, and second, last question. Uh, if someone is out there thinking of starting a, a, a software project today, um, what would you recommend they actually do to get started? Is it, is it just a case of like taking their idea, building it, and then figuring out how to launch it? Or do you like look at the market first? What's the, what's the get it off the ground approach? Well, there, there's a couple of things. Uh, most, most of the time when you're starting, when people start a software project and they're not, they've never done it before, they just kind of have this idea in their mind and they don't actually write, they don't actually take the time to do all the research and do all of the legwork up front to really document everything, what needs to happen. How is the, how's it gonna work? Like doing mock-ups and wireframing to just kind of have a visual of what it's gonna look like before you go through even the process of designing the user interface and definitely before you even start coding the backend work. So um, that's really important to have all that down on paper and, and really dig into the, the details because it's gonna save you so much time, money, and energy um, once you actually start to execute on the plan. And then the other thing I would say is having a technical resource, having someone that you can trust that knows what the hell they're talking about because there are so many people, uh, developers in particular, that say, yes, 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 I can do all this, no problem whatsoever. And they, you know, when push comes to shove and they've already billed you for $10,000, you realize they didn't know what the hell they were doing and, and, you, and you lost out on that money. So I think it's really important to find uh, either a, a technical partner that you trust or a technical resource that could be a, a development agency that you trust that can really do the due diligence on when hiring those developers to make sure that they know what they're doing, that the way that you are developing it is architected properly. Um, so you don't go, you know, six months down the road and you're like, well, we did this the wrong way. We need to scrap it or we need to redo half of it. Right. So a lot of it comes down to, again, doing your due diligence, getting your, um, you know, researching what's going to be the best approach before you even put your pen to the paper. I think that's really good advice, actually. And speaking from my own experience, uh, having never launched a successful software product, but <laughs> actually started one or two, I think that was the mistake we made. It was like, oh, this this idea, let's get a developer and start building, building, building. But in actual fact, when you when you put put like your notes down and, and start planning out what are all the 
um, phases that we need to push push people through and what do we need to build? What information do we need to store? It's like, it's even a simple idea is a lot more complicated than than, than you first think. So yeah, so that's yeah, good advice yeah. there. Yeah, I mean, so usually what we'll do is we'll break it out into milestones. So we'll break them into like little mini sprints or mini milestones. And we'll say, okay, well, milestone number one is this. And then we'll even have like, the, the, the wireframe for it so you can visually see what it's going to look like and we'll have the user interface designed so that when the developer, which the, the majority of the time is going to be, the, the majority of the time and money spent is going to be the backend development work. So you th that backend developer should have a crystal clear picture of exactly what they need to do Okay, because it's it's written out in written format as well as in visual format what needs to happen. And you should already have an estimate as to like how much time it's gonna take for them to do it. And you need to hold them accountable. And if it starts to, and so many technical projects, you're spending two, three, four, ten 10 times more than you even anticipated, right? And so technical projects can get just out of hand so quickly. And so that's why it's so important to have, you know, your milestones and everything organized. And, and there's a clear picture between you, your design team and your development team. Nothing pisses off a developer more than uh, a, a non-technical person coming in and say, oh, can we just add this? Can we just yeah. do this? Can we just do this? And that's been me um, on several occasions. So yeah. avoid yeah, that. Yeah, it should only possible. take you an hour, but in actuality, that's that's a week's worth of work. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, that's been really good. Is there anything which I should have asked you, which I haven't asked you? I mean, I could talk about this for hours or hours. So I mean, if you got all day, you know, we can, we can keep going, but uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I would, I would love for anyone who, you know, if you're uh, an entrepreneur uh, running an online business, I'd love for everyone to, to check out pay kickstart. Um, you can take a, a free trial. We also have a Facebook group, which is really cool. So we have a lot of like-minded entrepreneurs in the Facebook group. So just go to Facebook and type in pay kickstart and uh, I'm in there and there's thousands of, of entrepreneurs in there as well. So we love just kind of talking shop and helping each other out and help, you know, grow our businesses. So. And if people want to follow you, do you have, are you on Twitter or anything like that? Um, I don't really use Twitter that much. I'm not that ADD. I, I try to stay away from social media as much as I can. So we have our Facebook group, which is uh, the, the main area. Um, so feel free to, to contact me there. Um, or you can, you know, contact our support team and just kind of attention mark and um, they'll forward it to me. So awesome. Well, thanks again, Mark. Uh, if you guys enjoyed this episode, don't forget to leave us a like on YouTube, subscribe there if you're not already subscribed uh, or on your favorite podcast platform, you, um, not YouTube, Spotify, <laughs> uh, Stitcher, Apple. Did, did they change the name of Apple iTunes? It's like There's Apple too many podcast options now. now. <laughs> I call it, keep losing track. Go there, subscribe if you haven't done so already. Gail and I will be back next week with an, another episode. So we'll see you there.